to me, what has been really rewarding is, you know, you can look at brands that somehow, you know, sometimes express themselves in really nice, fun, inviting, engaging types of ways. And then you dig in a little bit more and you go, oh, okay, it's a marketing campaign. And I think that to me, the real joy here was like, no, that's kind of how the company is. I'm Carolyn Hadlock, Executive Creative Director at Young and Laramore. And this is the Beautiful Thinkers Project, a podcast where I ask founders, creators, leaders, and visionaries how they bring their ideas to life. As we enter these conversations with thinkers across disciplines like art, science, and business, we'll learn a little bit more about the practices and identifiers that create beautiful thinking, something defined so individually, but so universally recognizable. Welcome to the Beautiful Thinkers Project. Today, I'm talking with Kevin Lynch, who's creative director at Oatly. Kevin is in Malmo, Sweden, by way of Shanghai, and before that, Chicago. One notable thing about Kevin is he is the first second-time guest in the Beautiful Thinker series. So welcome to the show again. Thank you very much. Lovely to, uh, lovely to be back with you. Well, so I know you started with Oatly right after the Super Bowl, or maybe right before. Yeah, that's correct. In, in January, uh, like right at the beginning of 2021. What a notable time to move and start a new job. And so I'd love just to start with how did that happen? How did you leave Shanghai for Malmo? <laughs> for sure. Yeah, that, that, that's not the normal course of action. Is that what you're trying to suggest? Yeah, which I would expect uh, nothing less from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, in, uh, I was in Shanghai for about eight years uh, working with uh, BBDO for a while. And then I jumped over to uh, become the director of marketing at Shanghai American School which is uh, China's oldest and largest international school. It's been around since 1912. And uh, so I was in the midst of that when I got a call from a, an old friend in New York who said, hey, I'm trying to help a friend in Sweden find a creative director in Shanghai. And she said, I checked my LinkedIn uh, friends and you're literally the only person I know in town, which I, I was like, thank, thank you for being so selective. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I said, you know, I just signed on for another year with the school and, uh, you know, so I, I couldn't do it. But, you know, let me know a bit about the company. She said, it's Oatly. I said, great. Can you spell that? Because <laughs> uh, they, they had just come to China in, in the previous year and I just I hadn't come across them yet. Uh, she sent me a few links and I called her back the next day and I said, you know, to hell with you. I'm giving you no one's name but my own. As it just, it, it really felt like it was a brand that I could easily get really passionate about in terms of what they believed in, how they expressed themselves. Uh, it looked like they were having a bunch of fun. So ultimately the role in, in China wasn't quite right, um, but we stayed in touch. And uh, a year and a half later, I basically forced myself uh, <laughs> yeah, through the door. I, I told John Schoolcraft, who heads up the uh, Creative Globally uh, in September, I said, listen, I'm finishing up in Shanghai in December and in January, I'm flying to Sweden and I'm going to start working for you. And I said, I, I hope you know we can figure out contract details by uh, by the time the Christmas party rolls around. Otherwise, it's going to be really awkward. <laughs> and it was lovely that the you know the following week he he comes through and says, "Okay, hey, we have a role. This this would probably make a lot of sense." It sounds like you approached the job in the spirit of the brand, which is very irreverent and you know kind of um, unapologetically direct and human. So, how has it been just acclimating to the company and to the country? Like, what are some surprises and some things you didn't anticipate? I think it's been great. And in part because of sort of where it started, which was in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of winter, joining a company that's working remotely without my family here. Like it was kind of, you know, the worst, sort of the worst of all scenarios. Yeah. And I still was having a good time. So <laughs> I felt like that was probably a pretty good indicator that, uh, that it, was, it was the right move. To me, what has been really rewarding is... You know, you can look at brands that somehow, you know, sometimes express themselves in really nice, fun, inviting, engaging types of ways. And then you dig in a little bit more and you go, oh, OK, it's a marketing campaign. And I think that to me, the real joy here was like, no, that's kind of how the company is. There's such a passion for fulfilling the mission of the company, but there's also a passion for kind of doing it in, in their own way and making sure that that people are going, you know, are changing through laughter, not lecture. and 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 it's because it's real tempting to get into the lecture when you start to look at, you know, the benefits of the product. Um, it's, it's easy to kind of get into this education mode and they do a really lovely job of avoiding that and going, Hey, if you're not smiling first, you're probably not going to be listening. I know that 
your department is called Department of Mind Control, <laughs> which is really fun. So I'd love to hear about that. And then also hear about how creative is at the center of the company. Yeah, for sure. When you look at the influence that the sort of creative, and I, would, I wouldn't call it a department, I, I would literally say it's sort of like the creative DNA of the company has um, really been uh, enhanced once Tony uh, Peterson joined in, I believe it was late 2012. Yeah. He pulls on John Schoolcraft soon after, pulls on Martin and Lars and, and a, a bunch of the rest of the gang soon follow. And, and a lot of it was John's conversation with Tony saying, Hey, like, I'm not going to come in and be, you know, the leader of a marketing department. I'm going to come and shake some things up and, and really and kill gonna... the marketing department. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Like create the client that you always wanted to work with. That client is not overly layered. They don't look at creative as this, you know, nice little thing that maybe you have. It, it really is rather infused in everything that you do from your packaging to your distribution, to your product development, um, all those things. Yeah. I think the relationship and the, the uh, agreement that John and Tony had early on is really what's been a, God, I was going to say secret sauce. How, how cliche is that? <laughs> <laughs> but I think it really is what, what makes the place special and makes the culture hard to duplicate. Yeah, that's cool that that actually is real. Like you said, so ma- so often, you know, these things look good. And then once you get inside the doors, it's it's a different um, situation. Can I, can I tell you a funny, yeah, from, like my favorite um, point of that? Literally my first week here, we had an issue with, a, uh, with one of the markets in Europe where we were potentially going to have some lawsuit for one of our uh, phrases and we started talking about the fact that we've been sued, you know, a number of times or, yeah. or had you know, yeah. had legal action a number of times from various uh, dairy lobby, lobby groups and industry yeah. groups and what have you. And in this meeting, we're like, we're figuring out, OK, how do we react to this one particular market? And one of the creative directors, Michael Lee, said, you know, he goes, we're kind of getting to be really good at this. We should just start a law firm and it should oh just be God. like, you know, the only law firm and we should offer up. Um, advice to any plant-based marketer that's trying to create change that will help impact uh, the environment in a, in a positive way, we could just help them, you know, navigate some of the problems that we're, we're navigating. And it was the kind of thing where, you know, another company go, wouldn't it be great if you did X and everyone laughs yeah. and then no one does anything. And it was fascinating because Michael mentions this in a meeting and there's maybe a half dozen different areas of uh, uh, that were represented in the meeting. And every one of them is like, yeah, no, that that's, yeah, we absolutely have to do that. And, and, and so, you know, everyone started going around the room going, well, here's why it'll work here. This is why it makes sense here. Here's how we can support here. That conversation jumped to a few other, a few other meetings, eventually are talking to our lawyers, um, the people we actually do, 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 uh, do work with. And they were sitting there banging their heads against the wall. They're going like, it's a great idea. Like, I don't think we can make it work because ultimately it would open up the, the company to liabilities. In other words, we would be financially liable for any legal advice that we we offered, even if it was a separate entity and gotcha. blah, blah, blah. But it was fascinating watching so many different parts of an organization try to problem solve. Even your lawyers are going, God, how can we start a law firm? Like, really? Yeah, you're you're trying to be creative in, in this as well. And I would say if you ever want to know how good your organization is, come up with a good idea. Because once you do, it's like you'll see, are people putting roadblocks in front of you or are they kind of helping you give it momentum and, and get it out the door? And I think it was just, to me, it was it was a really nice example of, of this place that it's best um, fulfilling the, the kind of momentum that you would expect from the outside. Well, and I think that's such a great point too, because maybe number one is procurement and number two is the legal inside the industry of just being the biggest enemies of good work because you guys have to like task your your legal <laughs> department, right? With the things you do and what you say and and how you kind of celebrate the controversy. So it seems like though there's a really tight relationship there. There is, yeah. It's uh, If you look at the mission that we're trying to fulfill, you know, ultimately... If we're going to make it easier for people to make choices that have a more positive impact on the planet, things have to change. Infrastructures that are built, yeah. profit centers that are that are built, industries that are built will have to change their focus or evolve in some way. And that's really, that's a tough thing for a lot of folks and a lot of organizations. And so, yeah, we, we absolutely expect pushback. And I think if if no one was pushing back, 
then either our, our vision was, is not bold enough or how we're executing it isn't effective enough. So it is better to be debated than ignored. Yeah, oh gosh. Oh, absolutely. And I wanted to, you to talk about the New Zealand launch that uh, you just uh, talk about that in the, the two billboard strategy and posting somebody's email. The launch into New Zealand is, I think, another really good example of, of how this place works. So you have a creative team, Bjorn and Anita, who have this really funny idea to do a really long billboard. And that's you know certainly in keeping with with uh, Oatley's voice, we, we do tend to be a bit long-winded uh, at times. <laughs> and so you go, okay, that could be really funny because that breaks your main, your, your main rule of outdoor. So that, that could be really cool. And then Bjorn says, yeah, he goes, you know, um, maybe we should actually like run out of space. And so we just have to buy another billboard. And you're like, you know what? It was a really fun idea at, at first. And now it's like, gosh, it's even more remarkable. Yeah, let's buy that second billboard. And then you had uh, Sheena over in media go, you know, if we're going to buy the second billboard, it should be just like for like one sentence, you know, That's like amazing. It's, you, should, you know, like all, all you needed to do is edit of your 623 words on the first billboard. You should maybe have edited, you know, 10 of them so you could fit the whole thing. It's like, no, 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 no. Let's buy a second billboard. And so so we buy the second billboard and we only have a sentence or two on, on that one as well. And then and then you have Ida doing the copywriting and going, you know, somewhere in here, we should, if someone's going to take the time to read this, we should reward them with an opportunity to sort of connect on a sort of personal, more human level. And so she writes copy that says, yeah, you should, you should write to our friend, Martin. He'd be delighted to, to write you back, even if he is on, on, on holiday. And so like, if you look at that sort of every person involved in every step of the way, it just continued to get better and and a bit more remarkable. And, And ultimately that's, uh, that's how it ended. It was a two two uh, billboard set, and Martin was writing emails to uh, to various strangers around the world on his on his vacation, and he was just sending he was sending them holiday pictures as well. So oh, everyone kind of benefited from the from the interaction. So I think it, it's a nice reflection on the fact that you know when we look at Oatly, we don't look at it as a brand or a brand voice. We really look at it as sort of this human connection and opportunity to connect in a human way, and and uh, and I think that's a really good example. You obviously had success and recognition, but it doesn't seem that it would be the kind of thing that you guys would go, okay, now we need to do that in every market. Yeah, certainly not. You know, and, and, I, and it's interesting. You have, you know, you definitely have that suggestion from various distributors or what have you. People go, okay, that, that would work well here. It's like, it kind of wouldn't work as well here because it's been done. And, and so, you know, I think anytime we're rolling out something that we've done previously, um, you might see some similarities, but you'll see a continued evolution uh, constantly. For example, uh, the uh, it's like milk, but made for humans. We have a, a, a campaign that's sort of heavy on that messaging with Tony in the video and yeah. and what have you. Every time that that's rolling out to a new market, there's a new component to it. Right now, it's rolling out uh, this summer in in Switzerland. And as part of that, we have a, a guy in North Carolina who teaches the recorder. <laughs> we did videos with him where, where um, he's basically teaching people how to play, you know, wow, no cow, but on the recorder, it's like, all right. And, and, and sure enough, it's usually the new components of these campaigns that are kind of giving a nice PR lift or a nice sort of sort of buzz as, as they go along. So that's always the fun part. It's never a plug and play. It's a, OK, this worked here. How do we tweak that and continue to evolve? Yeah. I also thought it was interesting to uh, to read about the strategy. You know, you were really targeting what I think you call the post milk generation mm-hmm. um, in younger people, and how in knowing you have to have a sampling strategy. And then, but the way you guys went about it was really interesting by the very grassroots effort of just getting into coffee shops. You know, even in the billboard in New Zealand, you guys had a connection to a coffee shop and. And how is that, how is that working for you? Are you guys still utilizing that strategy? I thought it was fascinating. You know, having, having that product available in the top cafes and in the markets that we're, we're entering speaks volumes about the quality of, of the product itself. You know, um, baristas have to deliver a really high-end product. And so they have, they have confidence in Oatly. That gives retailers confidence in Oatly. It gives um, people a nice accessible way to, to, uh, to try oat milk. You know, when you when you look at it from a product standpoint, it makes sense. But even more so, when you start to get into the mission of the company, um, and you get into the sustainability um, benefits, they're independent owned, usually by people who are who have a, a strong conscience about 
about the environment and about sustainability. You know, the Venn diagram has a lot of sort of crossover. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you started in Chicago for a long time. You were there at BBDO Energy. I mean, what advice would you give American brands today based on your experience working on Oli? I will butcher a quote from my fellow creative director, Michael Lee, who said in a different podcast, to really have the kind of success Oatly has had, you need a Tony and we already have him. <laughs> um, and and, and I, I do think there's a, there's a ton of truth to that in, yeah. in the sense that this wasn't a creative department decision. This wasn't a marketing department decision. Having creativity at the, at the core of the business is instrumental and, and making sure that that mission and that charge is coming from the top. It's not coming from the CMO. It's coming from the top. That is the hardest part to duplicate yeah. because it's really tough to, to find a someone at the CEO level who has an appreciation for some of the nuances of a really good piece of creative communication. Yeah. The rule-breaking aspect of it. Can I bitch for a minute? Yeah, of course. Tim Nudd just in, interviewed the CEO of Motel 6 who said, we're going to keep Tombow dead and we're going to keep the the line, you know, we'll leave the light on for you. He goes, but, but, you know, where we really needed to tweak it is that we're going to emphasize for you. So we'll leave the light on for you. And you, and you're listening to the CEO and you're like, yeah, like that's, that's why that type of thinking and, and that type of involvement and in sort of micromanagement and frankly, just getting stuff wrong is what will keep a lot of brands from having the success that they could have. Yeah. So how would you describe the voice of Oatly? I know it's, you talked about it's more human, but as a, especially as somebody with a writing background, how would you articulate that? The description that we hear, I hear internally a lot is, is oat punk. Um, (laughs) That's fun. I think there's a nice truth to that. You know, partly you say oat punk, it's like, okay, I can kind of imagine that. But because the term doesn't exist, it leaves you open to interpretation. I think that's probably the right thing for us. You know, it's, I mean, ultimately, it's its a mission-driven organization, you know, that's trying to change a bunch of norms. And so that's where you're going to get your, you know, a little bit of a, a punkishness, a little bit of a, a prodding. And, and that comes out, you know, looking at ourselves, not as a brand, but as a human, I think that comes out. I think probably the most distinctive thing about the brand's voice is bravery. You know, um, being able to call out, you know, sort of the elephant in the room, being sort of transparent about our intent. Hey, we made this poster because we're trying to sell you oat drink. It's like, yeah, you know what? I I appreciate that honesty, Um, you know, and being self-effacing and self-critical, you know, um, assuming that people probably didn't start their day thinking, I hope I see an oat drink ad today. Like that is not a thought process that most marketers have in their heads but it's what most people have in their heads. You know, I didn't want to see a shoe ad. I didn't want to see an an oat drink ad. I'm not in the market for a car. We say, hey, you probably didn't want to see an oat drink ad today. So I'm sorry. (laughs) And then that's that. It's like, yeah, that's cool. And, you know, the irony, of course, is that we'll probably stick in in their minds more than if we told them all about an oat drink. Yeah, Um, for sure. And um, And I think humor, you know, humor is such a loaded word for marketers today. I mean, especially in this pandemic slash post-pandemic maybe world, everything's super heavy and dramatic and sentimental. And, but I also know that humor is one of the hardest things to take across cultures. Um, But it seems like you guys don't really change your tone of voice for, you know, the country you're in, or is that true? And then is it, do you think it's very Swedish humor? How would you describe it? I do think your observation that that we um, are ourselves, no matter where we are, is pretty right on. And again, it's a it's a reflection of what uh, John uh, Schoolcraft talks about. Where if you go on holiday to France, it's like sure you might have more wine, you might you know learn a couple of you know bonsoir, bonjour, you know, but you're still you. And ultimately, as we look at the brand as, as a human, we go, well, how does a human act? Well, humans kind of themselves, no matter where they are. Yeah. I think that's really kind of the guiding light that has the similarities, regardless of which market we're in. Um, you'll, you'll kind of see the strong, you'll see a consistency of, of us just kind of being us. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what a lot of brands are focusing on, this sort of like global scale, but local attitude or vo- this hyper-local um, and it sounds like you guys are not really getting on that bandwagon as much. 
Yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't know if that really reads very authentic to people, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, how many, how many times do you have to do, Hey, Chicago land. You're like, you know, <laughs> I lived in Chicago a long time. I've never heard of Chicago land outside of commercials. Uh, so I know. Yeah. I, I, so I do think there's, the, yeah, I don't think that, uh, I think being, being authentically yourself will, will always probably resonate stronger, um, regardless of whether you're a person, a brand, what have you. Yeah. I want to shift a little bit to you and your path. You've done this geography jumps and you've also done, you know, your agency and then you were kind of in the academic world and then now you're on the brand side. And how are you feeling now versus when you first started in this business? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think that the, the career path has been super instinct, instinct driven. You know, I'm, I'm personally attracted to things I haven't done before. You know, there's certainly been a range in terms of roles and geography and and industries, but ultimately I could go through every step and go, well, I'd never done this before. And that seemed like a really cool challenge at the beginning of, of my career. I just thought, okay, this is, this is a nice sort of way to live or a nice way to approach things. So for example, I had this philosophy of like, you know, never go to bed until you have a story to tell. It's the kind of philosophy that like it could be a deep, you know, sort of deep thing that you learned. It could be a movie that you saw. It could be a way you took home. It could be like a conversation that you had. It could be anything. But it's like if you were kind of challenged, someone said, how was your day? Like and you don't have a story to tell them, then go create one. And I think by doing so, it pushes you out of your comfort zone and, and you know, and, and kind of gets you used to used to doing a little bit more experimentation and being vulnerable and you know, putting yourself in vulnerable places or situations. The other thing it does is it just gives you a raft of stories. Like you do that for a year and you probably have 300 plus stories yeah. you know, as you're kicking around, you know, concepts for an assignment or you're in a presentation or you're trying to connect with a, you know, potential client or, or what have you, you've got a lot of things to kind of draw from. Talk about the year B and B. Cause that was such a fascinating you, and you've done so many projects like this. Yeah, the Airbnb was um, was again a little bit of an organic project. It was we we'd moved to Shanghai, and after a year, BBDO said, "Hey, can you can you take lead on Hong Kong and Guangzhou for for the creative?" And that would mean you know moving to to Hong Kong. And so my wife and daughter were just getting settled in Shanghai. I said, "You know what? Take take the second year. I'll move to to Hong Kong. I'll be there for a year." I came back maybe the second weekend from Hong Kong. And I said, oh, Hong Kong's really terrific. We can do this. We can do that. We can live here. We can live there. And I'm looking at their their eyes and they're just like totally glazed over. And I'm like, you're not coming to Hong Kong, are you? Yeah. And uh, yeah. sure enough, they're like, you know, Shanghai is great. And uh, so so it meant I was flying back and forth. Yeah. And so be it. My goal was to uh, stay just in Airbnbs in Hong Kong for that first year and to stay in a different neighborhood each time. And so that would not only... Um, make up for some of the loneliness of not having the family there. It would also give us a nice sort of uh, knowledge base to go, okay, because we don't necessarily want to end up in the expat bubbles of, you know, Happy Valley or yeah. Central yeah, or what sure. happened. And, and so, yeah, so ultimately the family didn't come. It turned into a three-year thing and, and I ended up in 140, 136 different Airbnbs. Wow. And yeah, on, on all 18 districts and nine islands and, uh, and in just about every you know sort of situation you could possibly um, could possibly put yourself into, and you know I think that I think it was a really transformative uh, experience because it really got you down to what's a want and what's a need. Yeah, you know if you're able to delineate that and you go, I, I actually only need X, then I think happiness is a little bit easier to achieve. Yeah, you know you're, managing your expectations. Yeah, totally, totally, and just being able to live, you know, sort of under any circumstance. You know, I moved to Malmo in January um, with two suitcases and a, and a guitar, which is funny because I I don't play guitar, but but um, I think that the Airbnb thing was really transformative and and just making making me really pliable to to find happiness in just about any situation. Yeah. So as I was telling you, the theme of the season is mother um, in all its iterations and kind of looking at it in a non-gendered way as well. Obviously, Oatly is pays off the sustainability and the mother nature of our planet. But I want to hear about Cheryl the World. Do you have a story 
about your mom? Cheryl the Whirl. Yeah, that that uh, that was a nickname. I don't know if we ever shared that with her. <laughs> 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 But uh, but she certainly she certainly lived up to it. And when when I look back at at her and and her life, she always had like any interaction that you had with her, she was going to make that memorable. Whether it be some bizarre thing she pulled out of her purse or some comment that she would make, the thing that that I think was one of the best contributions from her was was just the exposure to to being yourself and knowing that that you're going to be rejected by some people and and that's perfectly okay. And you know, I th- I think when you look on social media now, you see a lot of people who are like, you know, yeah, you just do what you want to do and screw the right like there's yeah. there's a there's an aggressiveness and it's like it doesn't need to be aggressive like just just be you. Like you don't need to tell everyone that you're just being you. Like just just be you and kind of live with those consequences and and she really lived to that um in her life. So in thinking of of your other questions and thinking of Cheryl the world, it, it just it felt like that was a that was a really nice sort of lasting contribution. Uh, yeah, I like the idea that she made everything memorable. Is there any specific event or not even something big, but like what would be an example of that? Maybe even something super small. Yeah, you know, she she um, the first time my wife met her. She said to my wife, Kathy, you know, hey, would, would you like some gum? And, and Kathy said, sure. And she pulled out three huge Ziploc bags, each with with like tons of stacks of gum with all the wrappers taken off. <laughs> and, and each of them was labeled with a different flavor. It, it was literally like hundreds of sticks of gum. And my wife was looking at that. And my mom went on to say how much time she saves by not having to unwrap each one um, separately each time. And she, she basically tried to sell my wife on pre preparing f- your, your gum uh, food <laughs> preparation. That's I awesome. That, but, but it, yeah, it was like just, gum it, prep. It took totally gum <laughs> prep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She was always just kind of in, in her own world. Um, and it was a really fun, fun world to be in. That's cool. Okay. Last question. How would you define beautiful thinking? I would define beautiful thinking as thinking that brings an aspect or finds a solution or a framing to a problem that hadn't previously existed. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thank you so much, um, Kevin, for making this happen. I was really looking forward to chatting and it sounds like you have found a really great home in a very really great culture uh, so far so good yeah i really appreciate it and, and thank you so much for the uh, for the invitation thank you so much for listening to this episode i hope you found something that inspires you to think strange different new and beautiful thoughts this podcast was created and produced by young and Laramore, an independent agency focused on helping national consumer brands take a stand To explore more about today's conversation and all of the other thinkers I've spoken to, check out our blog, The Beautiful Thinkers Project, or follow us on Instagram at The Beautiful Thinkers.